Our honorary Knight Rider historian, Jacob Peterson, has scored yet another interview with Knight Rider royalty. This time it's producer and writer during Knight Rider's first three years, Tom Green. Tom was responsible for some of the best episodes of the show, including Nightmares and Goliath Returns. In fact, Tom had so much to share with Jacob that they chatted for hours. Here's part one, which covers how Tom got started in Hollywood and on Knight Rider, some Easter eggs he placed in the Nightmare script, and why, at one point, he had to defend the fact that Michael and Kit were platonic friends only. So check out part one of Jacob's interview with Knight Rider producer, Tom Green. It's all about Knight Rider, and I have the huge pleasure of talking to Knight Rider producer and writer Tom Green. Tom produced 57 episodes of our favorite TV show, and he uh, wrote uh, six episodes. So he has a lot of memories from Knight Rider, and in this first episode of the interview, uh, I will talk with him more in depth around uh, uh, how he got the job as producer for Knight Rider um, and also um, the role of the producer at this point in time. Uh, I hope that you'll enjoy it. Hello. Oops, hold on. Hello. Hello. Hi, hello. Can, hi, can you see and hear me? Yeah, I can. Can you see and hear me as well? I do with all the um, uh, what, uh, what am I trying to say? Um, the the Night Rider behind you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I have to find some kind of a of, of good setup for doing an interview like this. I was going to wear, uh, but or, or show you, but if which I'll say when we talk in the um, uh, in my uh, keynote speech, I was wearing my Night Rider cast and crew jacket. If you yeah, remember. Which... So, but I, I think we should uh, we should just start. Of course, um, I would like to, to to learn first of all where were you in uh, in your life when you got the job of uh, of uh, producing and writing for Night Rider. Well, yeah, that I will try to give you a shorter version of that, but because uh, I had kind of an interesting background, um, I actually was. All of this is blessed. I I look at it. I was not. Um, you know, I won the lottery. Basically, I worked hard at it, but I didn't have. Uh, anyone, you know, I, I was not, uh, you know, um, uh, Steven Spielberg's daughter or something. I mean, you know, I, uh, my father was a, uh, a fame, a very well-known writer, but is he was uh, one of the Hollywood ten people. He was blacklisted, and uh, and so he wasn't able to write. He had a wonderful line, which for those out there who are want to write or know about writers and i'm writing by the way or just finished a script which i'm turning into a novel which will be made into a film a little victories about my childhood growing up with the fbi at our house all the time bugging our house uh, getting my father fired from any little job he had and he used to say love thy enemy it makes him so damn mad and uh, i had a great childhood but he wasn't allowed to write anymore but when he had the time, we had an apricot tree in the backyard, which actually was one of the things that kept us alive because my mother made everything out of apricots. And he would sit in there with his legal pad and he had a pen and he had been a lawyer and he lost his license because he refused to name names. Um, his mother had given him and his brothers who also became lawyers and dentists. And when they graduated, they got this pen. He still had the pen and he still had the writing tablet. And um, he'd set up an apricot tree and write novels, write things. And then he'd read them to me. I would be sitting on the ground looking up at my father in the tree. And he would, and he was very dramatic and he would recite this stuff. I mean, these are amazing. But the point I want to make was I said to one time, I said, Papa, 
how can you keep writing and do it the way you write, knowing you know that the governments are going to never let you publish anything? And he had this kind of Cheshire cat smile, and he said to me, Tommy, they could take away the girl, but they can never away, they can never take away the love affair. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, take moment. away the girl, but they can never take away the love affair. And so I mention all that because then all my life I was absolutely, and still am, you know, p- passionate about writing. And um, without going into a lot of details, I, at, at, well, at, one thing I did was I um, had a student film I made in high school. Uh, that at the time Universal had a thing called the Kinetic Art Series where they bought uh, student films. In fact, I think one of the first ones they bought was George Lucas, as you know, THX, his first movie, was originally a student film. And, uh, and, but they, there was a thing where in schools uh, they would rent um, a, a collection, like a collection of cartoons or a collection, a collection of student films. At that time, because of people like George Lucas, who was just starting out, um, he hadn't even made American Graffiti yet, but um, the idea of student filmmakers, student film was a big deal in colleges. So they had a guy named Christopher Wood who, who would go around to um, these high school and college film festivals. And um, um, if you liked a film, they would buy it. And I made a film. Uh, it was for the San Mateo Film Festival. I had done some others. And they had sent me this uh, um, huge uh, rule book. This is what you. This is un, these are the things unacceptable for your film. It was like in the old days of the Hayes office with films where you can't say this and you can't do that. You had to have double beds. You know all this stuff, and it was all these things that that student films. Now of course you wouldn't want to have nudity or you couldn't use bad language, but there was ridiculous things in here. I'd never seen anything like it. So what did I do? I made a movie called Unacceptable, and basically I went down the line and broke every rule and the soundtrack was the judges watching this movie saying, oh my God, look what he's done. Look at him do that. Oh, there's a movie. Oh, this is unacceptable. This is, you know, and that was what the movie was. And then it got crazier and crazier and crazier. And then at the end, when it actually started getting interesting, they, you know, um, they said, well, we can't watch any more of this. And, the, and it cuts. Uh, and he bought the film. And uh, it, which was really wonderful. Oh, he sent, I sent it to the festival and they weren't going to put it on and some someone somehow snuck it in it wasn't even in the program because of course they, they were all upset about it and he saw it and that's it and so um i was still living at home and uh, uh you know 17 no, 17 at the time and but the people at universal uh the executives there they were a different breed in those days it was like a big family and they had the thing called the tower which is still there and um we went um they called me up. They said, we'd like to meet you. We'd like to meet someone who did this. It was done very, there was a lot of effects in it. Uh, I, I had a friend near us who had an effects house, and it was the old effects, of course. There's <laughs> no, but I did all kinds of, even even the, uh, you know what Academy Real is, where it goes eight, seven, yeah. six, five, yeah. four. So a very, in the very beginning, they get, oh, what's this? Why? Why is the Academy Real? We're not supposed to see that, but it went eight. Five, two, one, A, six, and then it had apple, you know, giraffe, you know, and all this. I mean, it had all this weird stuff in it. But they they started to talk to me, and Sid Sheinberg at that time, you know, had just found a student film called Amblin that a guy from Arizona State made uh, and brought him in to direct. Uh, and that was a guy named Steven Spielberg, you know, and he was he was there. He'd already done. He was doing TV at the time, TV shows. Anyway, but that allowed me into the lot and the, on the main um, uh, 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 booth, there was a guard who was very famous for about 30 years named Scotty. And even in movies, you'll hear them talk about, yeah, I went past Scotty, waved me in. And, and so Scotty knew me. And so and I had, I had my I wasn't even in my own car. I borrowed my father's 65 Valiant to drive there. And they said, look, we don't know what to do with you or everything, but we just want to say we really like you. Well, at the time they had, and I promise I'll make this much shorter, but I, I'll get to the point. But they had a, um, a like a, an area that was like a forest still, which they used to shoot in. And they had cat, they built cabins in there, and that's where their feature film division 
directors, producers were, but Universal at the time did not do a lot of feature films. They were not big, but really hit hard was a movie called The Sting, if you remember, and that was this huge hit one, Best Picture, and then they started making movies. But my point is, I was able to go on the lot after that, and I went into one, and a lot of these cabins were um, deserted. And I went into one of them, and I actually, you know, and there were the uh, mailroom guys who were a little older than me, but I had them start to send me uh, the beat sheets of what's shooting on the lot and the stuff, and I was also able to get some of the scripts of the shows who were being done. And then what I would do is I would write notes and things on, on these um, scripts and then send them back to the producers. And they thought I was on, you know, on staff or whatever. And there's a lot more to the story, but I ended up... Um, being um, uh, mentored by this magnificent uh, uh, producer named William Sackheim. And he gave people like Arthur Hiller and Steven, uh, Steven Spielberg and Frank Pearson and uh, oh, just tons of um, famous people. Well, in, oh, John Badham, they were all, uh, Steve Bochco, uh, Steve Cannell, uh, they were all in his unit. And I was a kid. And so I was like a kiss ass flunky and, and slowly built my, my way up. But at eight, the next year, which is a whole another story I won't go into, but I was 18 and I got a, I got my writer's guild card and I got a, I was the youngest person to get a contract as a writer at Universal. And um, so that's how I started at Universal, which is the long way around the story. As a matter of fact, one of the things, you know, we're on strike right now. And then this was way back in the 1800s or whatever when I did <laughs> when I was 18. And uh, two weeks after I got my contract, um, the writers go went on strike. This is, by the way, my ninth strike that we're on right now. And I was uh, told to, with the other strike, up back and forth in the main gate where Scotty was. And do you know today, 2023, I am now back at the same gate, go, you know, going back and forth. At the time, I was a little kid looking up at all these old guys, you know, and they'd look at me and they keep saying, oh, is your father a writer? And I go, no, no, I'm a writer. <laughs> And now I'm the old guy looking at these little kids going That's back and awesome. forth. Yeah. But the wonderful thing about that time, and so that placement universal was at one point they were doing as many as 31 hour shows a week, mostly for NBC, which ironically they bought like 10 years ago. But so there was a huge amount of production going on. Everyone was working and they really needed. So they would put people under contract in term deals, writer producer contracts, uh, and you wouldn't be on a specific show at the time, and then they would place you on shows, like the old days of MGM, you know, what they do in feature films. And so you'd go on this show or that, and you didn't, these were not shows that, you know, they weren't that interested in you even creating a show because they needed you on all their big shows. And so I ended up, the very first show I did was something you might have remembered called The Six Million Dollar Man. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was still living at home, by the way, writing that show. And as a matter of fact, um, uh, my poor mother, they would sometimes, the executives, they would call me, you know, and they'd call my number. And so when my mother would answer the phone, she usually did. I, I told her, and she, I don't, can't believe she did. I said, Mom, will you answer the phone always as Tom, Green off, Tom Green's office? You know, so. <laughs> and of course, her friends would go, what? what are you talking about? And, you know, I said, but during business hours, just during business hours. And, uh, but the, and then I eventually, I did get an office and a secretary or an assistant, we call them. Uh, one line, I have to say, a side thing about that. One of the wonderful, wonderful executives there at the time was named Peter Safier. who did a lot. He's the guy who actually found in galleys a little book that he said they should buy and make into a movie it was called jaws so he he was very well liked at universal he's a wonderful wonderful man who's retired now pretty much but i had lunch with him about three or four years ago and uh, again and because he was in living he's his wife's um, french so he lives in paris most of the time but he was here and he said to me tom i have to admit something to you he says do you know that the reason the executives were calling you at home so much is because they all we all knew you lived at home and we all knew you had your mother answer and we would just call just to hear your mother say tom green's office and ask questions where is he oh he's uh, on the lot or oh he's uh, in a meeting you know and they would laugh and laugh and laugh so 
That's nice. That's good office humor. <laughs> yeah, so that was great. So I was doing all of those shows, and I did a ton of the uh, of these shows, and so. Um, at the time, to answer your question of two days ago <laughs> about where I was during Night Rider, um, the uh, I had done, as I said, uh, Six Million Dollar Man. I did a wonderful, uh, uh, which I went to a whole long story of a movie of the week I did called Case of Rape with Elizabeth Montgomery, and that's that's for another discussion. It's an amazing story it's about that, and then uh, a a. An Emmy-winning TV movie, which then became a series called The Law, which was Judd Hirsch's very first project. And as a matter of fact, I was his dialogue coach, and I was involved with John Badham, who directed it, a brilliant director, in his um, screen test, which I still have here at home. That's uh, and and uh, people like Al Pacino and uh, uh, Marty Sheen and uh, all these others wanted this part. It was Joel Lansky who became my mentor, one of the great writers of all time, had written this amazing piece. So anyway, I did all that. But then the thing that I to, to again come to your your the end of your, your, your <laughs> answer your question. I was incredibly exhausted because I had worked on two of Don Belisario's shows. And those who don't know, Don is a genius. And of course, he wanted to jag and all these other things, uh, Quantum Leap and whatever. But um, he had started, uh, I, I worked at the tail end of Bob Bob Black Sheep, um, just as a writer, but not working with him. But then I ended up for a long time, as you know, or you may have seen it with Magnum P.I., and he produced a bunch of Magnum P.I. episodes. Which, of course, there's a million stories on that. Uh, and then, without, which is another incredible Don Belisario story, which, again, I'm going to add myself and not go into these. What happened was he, and because this also has to do with Glenn Larson. Glenn Larson tended to get writer, uh, uh, writer producers who are starting out to go to him many times and say, look, if you put my name on this, because he was the hottest TV uh, producer at the time, if you let me put my name on this, oh, it's his project. So he would collect half of the residuals uncreated by, he can get it made, which he could. And that's what happened to Magnum. Magnum, if you know, has Don Belisario and um, Glenn Larson saying, Glenn had absolutely nothing to do with the project, never was on the project. It was all the genius of Don Belisario. Uh, but Don was a genius and he's still around, but he still is. But he was also a complete insane person. He was out of his mind. And, uh, and I mean that in a way lovingly, though at the time, as I think I mentioned, virtually every writer produced work for him got divorced. Yeah. I was living with this beautiful so, Greek girl. Yeah. But, uh, hey, she was gone because your entire life was obsessed with him. But he, he did it like if somebody was in his car and he, was, he, he says, oh, I got to get over there. And he goes to where he has to go and he turns around and sees five people bloodied on the ground and goes, oh, my God. And, and Jen goes, oh, my God, what happened to him? Goes around. He's not aware that when he wants to get to a point, in other words, he wants his shows to look as great as they could be, he's not aware of all the damage, the collateral damage he does to get there. And, you know, that's it. And, you know, but he was a, a genius. But I did that. And then after that, out of a very strange thing that he did, which was actually, although I love Magnum P.I., and I knew Tom Selleck before, and... Um, the greatest guy in the world to be work with and, and all then of course i was the hollywood producer but i got to fly first class to hawaii like twice a month or so it was really terrible to have to do that but anyway he then came up with a show called which was his first show that he got sole created by credit called tales of the gold monkey which is for many people consider one of the best shows was ever on tv it's the most beautiful show he getting all credit for that and he took me off a of magnum which is Another way of putting it, but it's a funny story which I'm going to, and I ended up on Tales of the Gold Monkey. And now Steve Collins starred in Gold Monkey, and Steve Collins starred in the original Star Trek. So I knew him all these years. We played foot baseball together and hung out and everything. And um, but that was my that was where I really came from. I was like my father. I loved the romance. It was an Indiana Jones thing. It took place on a tropical island in the 19, late 1930s, and it was all the, you know that kind of feel and that Humphrey Bogart you know to have and have not Lorne Bacall kind of feel to it, and uh, absolutely loved it. And the reason I'm mentioning all this is I I did all those episodes, which I think was about 28. So this is about three years, but that was all with Don Belisario. Uh, and so when Gold Monkey ended, um, 
I was actually thinking of maybe going some doing something else, and because I wanted to start developing my own projects, and um, uh, right while I was doing Gold Monkey, um, there was a producer, Night Rider, had just come on the air. Now Glenn Larson did produce that. I mean, did create that. But he wasn't, again, he wasn't that involved. A uh, uh, producer named Bob Senator yeah. uh, was really the executive producer involved. And he was a man who'd been around for a million years, mostly doing Jack Webb shows. You know, Adam 12, Emergency, um, um, Dragnet, those kinds of things. And a wonderful man. But he was really kind of like a David L. Selznick, old style person. Because, and of course, remember, these are days before computers or anything. But he would... Um, um, send out memos like Selznick did, like 25-page memos. And uh, they were having trouble with the show, which uh, and people who watch the show will notice there is a, a development change, especially into the second year when I got on it. Not that I was specifically responsible for that, but they were struggling with what the show was going to be. What, what Glenn Larson had written originally, and he admit, admitted it, was a modern Lone Ranger. And he literally, at the end of it, wanted a line. This would be, he literally, after every episode, wanted after he would go into a town or something with, with Tonto, with, you know, with his horse, with Silver, which was Night Rider. That's Silver. And, uh, and, Ki and the voice of Kid, it was Tonto. You know, it was, uh, that was his idea that, uh, I don't even know if there was a whole concept of an organization. There wasn't even maybe a reason of who he was, but he would mysteriously come to a town, solve a problem, and then literally spin off into the horizon, and they would literally say, who was that masked man? But they wouldn't say masked man, but that was the idea. And, uh, and of course, then, you know, the network got involved, and as you notice, if you watch it, it was kind of struggling, it, trying and being to sort of keep Lone Ranger, try to keep him somewhat independent, but then they had to bring in the Night Industries and Devin, you know, the Edward Mulhair, and then the girl, uh, uh, the you know and, and all this other stuff. Um, so they didn't quite know. And the reason I mentioned that was I knew Bob Senator. Long story because I actually got to work with Jack Webb on some things and got to know him. And so even though I was doing this, being in turn deals, we would help each other. You know, sometimes without credit, we would write scripts of other shows. I would I even went in and direct. I was in the guild, and so I, I even would direct some second unit stuff. And sometimes you would just do it at lunchtime. You know, which is kind of illegal, but you, you wouldn't even take credit. Yeah, you know, but this is what we did for each other. Or you would call and say, listen, uh, you know, hi, so-and-so, I'm having a little trouble. I really need an actor who can go, or I need so-and-so, or, you know, do you know a stuntman? And, oh, yeah, we know that, you know. And, and so there was this, and, no, and there was no competition like now. No one was stabbing because everyone was working. There was more work than, you know. So it was really wonderful. So he kept memoing me. I mean, I maybe saw him twice, but it's like email today. And, you know, the inner office mailman, mailroom boy would be, you know, you would have those, would be mail. And he was memoing me things on different episodes of, of the show. And um, uh, I would read the scripts and come to him, and then he would write back to me. And so, uh, sadly, and uh, we knew this, and our people didn't, he, I had, I, I don't know if it was a brain tumor or... Lung cancer. He had cancer, and but he kept working, and they were really surprised. And then one day he didn't show up, and he you know died pretty quickly after that. But I think, if I'm not mistaken, it was ironically at the hiatus time between one and two, and so I really was burned out. Honestly, I you know worked and said, and but they I was under term deal, and my deal was coming up for another year, and they came to me hat in hand. And they said, listen, you know, Bob Senator was telling me, you really seem to have a grasp of the show and all this. And now you've finished this show. Will you come on to Knight Rider? And to be honest with you, I didn't at the beginning really feel a lot where the show had gone. I knew intimately from him. Another reason, my father, being a writer before he got blacklisted, worked on a show called Route 66. I don't know if you know what that was. And that was, in fact, the... Uh, one of the uh, original actors just died not long ago, and, and Marty Milner, who did the Jack Webb shows, was in it. And it was two guys in a Corvette who go across the United States famous Route 66, which you may have heard of. Um, and it's just it's basically Night Rider, and they get involved in people's lives. 
but they don't have a talking car and they, you know, it's just these two guys. The thing that was so funny is how and why they can make money, you know, the act, the characters, because, of, but anyway, so I finally said, well, okay, I'll tell you what, I'll come in for a couple of episodes. You know, and that's how I kind of got started. And so, so you actually had quite limited reference regarding the the uh, the, the first part of the show, or or, or, or did you just? Well, I knew that? the show, but it kept changing. You know, what I read, you know, um, Glenn Larson's original Bible and his original script, which they shot something completely. They did a two-hour. I think it was called Phoenix. I think yeah, or something. Yeah, which was, yeah, yeah. Right, and um, you know, and then it turned to a series, but it was more in that vein. Um, and what I did on my, and you had said, which I, I was very complimented that you loved, um, nightmares, the episode nightmares. Yeah, and that, that was my first, I came in, I said to him, look, this is, I said to the network, this is what I want to do. If I'm going to come in, I want to wipe the slate clean. I want to start and want, we'll do what we call a franchise episode where you get to learn all what, who the characters are you know, um, from the beginning. And uh, I said, so I want to do a show in which Michael Knight uh, is um, in an accident and he gets amnesia. And when he wakes up, he thinks he's Michael Long. He thinks he's back being the police officer. And and so, of course, and then, you know, he, he escapes from the hospital. And then, of course, his crazy car starts following him. And who are you and what's going on? And, of course, Devin, they're trying to find him. And, but in doing that, he reestablishes his relationship with Kit. And uh, we can, I can, as a producer, can reestablish the whole idea of how he and Kit work together, what kind of stories we're going to do, and so forth. Yeah. And um, so uh, I did that. And... Um, for people out there, one of the things that uh, is, you know, there's lots of things about that show, but what's interesting for me, because on a lot of series that I did that were modern series, I would start my first show, if it was a show which was done, you know, in, the, in our time, in our you know time world, at the Sepulveda Dam. And the reason for that was that I, that's, I lived only about a mile away. I go, I was, I'm one of the only people born and raised in Los Angeles and in the Valley. I'm a Valley boy, as they say, in the San Fernando Valley, born there, raised there. And when I was old enough to walk, I know for years I would sneak off. And by the time I was maybe three or four, that dam uh, had uh, burst and flooded the San Fernando Valley. So it was decommissioned. But that amazing architecture and everything was still there, but there was no water on the other side of it. So, but I would, you know, climb over the fence, which you're not supposed to do, and I would play, you know, uh, up and down those incredible towers and things with all these fantasies. And then in elementary school for all these years, right, for most of it, I was madly in love with Kathy Reyes, you know, who of course would have nothing, I, nothing to do with me, of course. But uh, but I th I used to have this fantasy all the time that I would find a bomb at the foot of the dam and I would be able to like either kick it over the dam or do something. Now I'm not thinking that well it doesn't matter because there's no water, but I'm a kid. But you know this is my fantasy. I can do anything I want, and I would be absolutely save the entire Van Nuys and San Fernando Valley, and there would be a parade down Van Nuys Boulevard, and Kathy Reyes would be in the convertible with me, and you know that was it. Now the irony of that is is that one of the first shows I ever wrote. The Six Million Dollar Man, if people go back, there's an episode called Danny's Inferno, which is considered one of the most popular ever. And that exact thing happens. Steve Austin, the Six Million Dollar Man, ends up finding out that there is a bomb at the foot of the <laughs> dam. And remember, he has bionic legs and he kicks it over the dam into the water and say, you know, so my whole fantasies came in. And unfortunately, um, I had no idea where Kathy Reyes was by then, so you know, I, 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 you are know. in character as a producer yeah. uh, already from from your very early childhood. I love it. <laughs> yeah, it was, was a wonderful story. And when when this, when the Steve Austin, uh, there's a, there's a great shot where he's running across uh, the dam. But because the dam is so big and beautiful, they they did a really artistic shot where they're way way far behind. And you see the whole, all of the turrets of the dam, and he does, which is always very funny. And I, Harv Bennett, who is the producer creator of the show, um, who then, of course, did all these other things with. But uh, he's a genius because, I don't know, he knew that, because, you know, he, he ran like 80 miles an hour. 
you know, he because he had bionic legs. Yeah, 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 yeah. But if you remember when he's running, if you're having someone running fast, it looks like a silent movie. It's comical. So he said, well, we'll what we're going to do, and they actually developed a thing in the camera, because he's, of course, the days you know, in camera, where he's going normal, and then they were able to flip both the exposure and the speed, so he suddenly goes in slow motion. Yeah. And so here he is, and it worked. He's going 80 miles an hour, but he did it in slow motion, which you think about doesn't make sense. Yeah, anyway, but I, that was one of my greatest moments. I was 18 during Six Million Dollar Man, and there I am back at the dam watching Steve Austin. And I even asked the director, you know, can you run from here to, do, you know, he goes, yeah, that's what I'm going to do. And I think, well, that's what I did when I was <laughs> watching him do exactly what I did. And he actually does, you know, kick, well, to a certain point, then they use an effect, but kicks this bomb, which is just about to explode over the dam. But anyway, so I use that in Knight Rider. And uh, um, for that episode, there's a couple other things in there. Since it was my first episode, it's a homage to my father. Uh, people may not know. They mention it, but at the very beginning, Kit is they're, they're chasing a guy um, and who's at the dam, and he's talking about uh, Kit is talking about his tracking his abilities, yeah. and he says, "I'm like the old swamp fox." Yeah, the swamp fox. Says, yeah, yeah. Where that comes from is my father is a writer. One of his best-selling novels is called The Swamp Fox Brigade, and in American history during the Revolutionary War, Francis Marion, who was the swamp fox. Through the indigenous Indians learned about camouflage, and so he, it was like you know the um, Robin Hood and you know his his men, they were in the uh, forests and the stuff camouflaged completely. And here's the British out with their red coats and their you know the, the fife and drums marching and you know his people would suddenly just you know come up and literally some would be dug in like they still do dug in ditches in the ground with with you know grass over their heads and they pop up and you know annihilate and as a matter of fact one of the famous generals said that's not you know that's not good how can you do that that's not the way war is done anyway so he had written the swamp fox so it's for my father who had uh, by then sadly um passed away um right before that but he uh uh to his homage i use swamp fox which i also use at the end of the episode yeah where devin realizes and remember wait a minute he's tricking us <laughs> so, so that was you know that was really as a matter of fact um disney uh walt disney himself loved that and wanted to make it into a movie uh but because my father was blacklisted he couldn't use it so instead he found another book that no one really knew and he hired my father under the table to be the to the consultant and there's a old disney series called swamp fox with leslie nielsen of airplane and all this other you know fame yeah, yeah. Swan. but in those days he was a serious actor and he played the swamp fox which was something oh, wow. but the episode was also filled um which we writers do all the time we put in the names of um you know people that we uh we have friends or girlfriends or girls we wanted to be girlfriends or uh you know street names and you know we do and rob gilmer wonderful writer who's also on the show who did magnum with me as a matter of fact he loved to do that as well but um so that was really fun having to do that one thing else that there uh, in that episode which um uh if they watch this and be careful how i did mention this Sidney Harris was the director, and Sidney was a very well-known English director, and very serious, and very, but very good, very competent. And he really had a thing about actors. He really wanted good actors. And somehow, and that's how we get later to, uh, when we get to Kit the Cat. Um, and uh, about Gina Davis and that because I just that was my I got Gina Davis started which is an amazing story and I'm so proud of that but anyway um, at that time they were getting actors first of all Steve uh, uh, David is like uh, six 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 five yeah. and they were getting actresses who were like five two or five three <laughs> And as a director, you, you know, if you know what Apple boxes, they would literally have to put them on two or three Apple boxes, yeah. and, you know, and do. And it was crazy. And, you know, that's a whole nother story. But they got this actress, perfectly fine person. Uh, but I, she wasn't she, she wasn't that good at, at, at the part, quite frankly. And it might have been the part. I don't want to say anything about her. And I 
didn't deal with her at all because I didn't, I usually, ca I was very involved in casting, but because this was my first thing and I, I was well, suddenly involved with suddenly they're saying, hey, we want you to keep stay on the show. Uh, they were so impressed with just even the script. And I said, okay, I'll do five episodes. And then said, and of course I ended up with 57, but the, um, I was already working on something else uh, and I didn't go into, and the casting was really simple. It was her and I forget his name, wonderful actor with a great face who played the bad guy um, and a couple of the peripherals. So it wasn't that important, but um, the director uh, really did not get, did not get along with her. Not that she fought or did anything though. It was just, he didn't like her performances and he felt as a director, as you know, it, it makes the director look bad yeah. because the director is supposed to be able to guide and make any, you know, they can make Piazzadora look good or whatever. You know, they can make anyone look good. And uh, as a director myself, you know, that's a terrifying thing at some point when you've had to on location, get a local person or something. And even if they only have two or three lines, if, if you notice this, if they say the line's bad, everything crumbles. Yeah. The whole magic screen crumbles, yeah. Yeah. you know, and you have to be really careful. So anyway, the scene I want to mention is certain things happen and also some crew members, and we'll talk about the crew, um, had some issues with her for some reason, and I don't know what it was. Um, there's a scene in there which you can watch. And actually, Sydney Harris, when we saw the dailies, you know, dailies in those days, it was wonderful. We would actually go into a theater and they would screen every dailies on a screen because they were done on, on film. Yeah. It was really old. But uh, there's a scene in, in the dailies. I wasn't there when they're shooting. It was and it, it was supposed to be at the L.A. Dam. And if you remember, she's placed in like a vault. Yeah, 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 and it's fills with water. Yeah. If you remember that, that yeah. watch that sequence again because it's very funny. Because they sh now the sequence where they actually fill with water that was actually shot back at the studio uh, outside in a special set. And um, when the water comes up and actually goes over her head and she's screaming, and after she goes, <laughs> she does all this, and Sydney looks at me and says, Now that's acting. And everyone started <laughs> laughing, and I didn't realize what had happened was that the special effects guys didn't tell her that the water was gonna go over her head. So they put the water over her head and they left it for only about two or three seconds. But that's just terrifying because she's in this little thing. She can't move her arms. She can't, and then they let the water out. <laughs> so <laughs> she was forced into acting. <laughs> yes, when you when you see her sputtering and all that, that yeah. was that was real. And uh, that's, uh, that's nice. Can you talk more about, because, uh, you know, um, not being a, an integral part of the whole uh, uh, film industry, what was your job as a producer? It's a good question. It's very different. You know, it's interesting you say that. In television, uh, the producer or if there's an executive producer is the god. And nowadays, you know, we were called, now they make a big deal about calling people showrunners. Well, we were showrunners, but we weren't called showrunners. And uh, in, just so you know, in feature film, it's the reverse. The producers are the people who really do the work, which I'll explain in a second. Um, but when you see executive producers, it's the mistress, it's the guy who got the part originally, who maybe put the money in, it was all, you know. I'm not degrading them because many times they're the ones who really got it going, but they're usually not the ones who are, you know, involved specifically in the production. And, it, and what you'll notice now, it, it wasn't always like that, but on feature films, you'll see sometimes executive producer and you'll see six names and then yeah. executive producer and another seven names yeah. and exec yeah. and that's why because everyone become an executive producer now in producing in television you have different types of producers uh the specific ones is you have a producer who is basically the showrunner which i'll explain in a minute but then there is and sometimes they'll even call them in features you do the line producer and what a line producer is, is they are the budget people. The line producer is the one who you have what's called a pattern budget. For every episode, you have, you know, in those days, maybe it was a lot of it, like maybe 750000 an episode or even much less. And you have what's called a pattern budget, which is everything down to the paper clips is spelled out how much is to be spent for each episode. And it's up to the line producer to make sure you don't go over any of that. Yeah, yeah. Because, you know, uh, unless you get what you did, we did get many times on every episode, on every show we did, 
if the network wanted ratings and they wanted to bring in a guest star who was, you know, a hot babe or a, or a well-known guy, you, you would get what's called cast breakage. Yeah. And so because what people don't realize, guest stars in those days, they would get what's called top of show, which means they, it was usually maybe a seven day shoot and they got paid for the entire seven days. So they were on call for the entire seven days. Yeah. You know, in the beginning when I was doing that, we're talking about guest stars, not the, the their top of show was fifty five hundred dollars. That was it. Yeah. You know, and so they had to do, you know, I used to talk to these, they'd say, you know, I have to do 10 to 12 shows a year in order for me and my family to, you know, and we're talking, you, you would know these people. But if they wanted to get uh, some main, Andrew Kell was a, an example yeah. of that. Yeah. yeah, We did a couple of episodes, that's funny stories about her, you know, and she, she was top of show. And so, but she was got more, they would get a lot. I did some shows in Magnum where they brought in some major people and and in those days too the top of the show was maybe 7500 and they were getting 50,000 yeah. for that episode you know and they do that type of thing so that's it but what my job as this as a show running producer would be is um you were involved basically first of all in you know um getting uh you would you would have I'm trying to think. I think in Knight Rider, I think we had 26 to 28 episodes a season. Yeah. When I first started in the, in the business, Tw we had like 22, I think. 22. 22 right. Yeah. Yeah, but, but we did sometimes what we did, like Goliath 1 and 2. Yeah, exactly. So, so that would be considered one show, but it would be two hours. Yeah. You know, and then we did Return of Goliath, which I have a funny story about, which was also one and it was two. I, mean, I think that was a two hour show as well. Yeah. But anyway, um, uh, so the first thing we have to do, of course, is um, work with the writers and start creating stories. Now, in those days, and the reason I think, I, I know we're not doing Chekhov and Shakespeare by any stretch of the imagination, but I think a reason that people love these shows so much, and there's an interesting thing about Knight Rider, which was, um, again, the network, the person they would first yell at would be the producer, not the studio, you know, so I would, that was the other thing we would get. And there's many funny stories about that. But, you know, at one point I was talking about giving David, who was actually a very good actor. And you got to remember, he came from soaps. Yeah. David could take a script, a scene and go, mm -hmm. okay. And he, he, he remember, you know, that because you had to learn to do that in soap. He would know every line. No matter how, whatever he did the night before, how much sleep he got, he, he came in prepared, looking great, and knew every line and all that. And I was giving him more and more. And they kept saying, you know, you don't have to give so much to David. David's not that important. You know, it's the car. And, the, and I said to them, you are such schmucks. You have no idea the chemistry, the lightning in a bottle that David Hasselhoff. No, again, he's not Laurence Olivier. You know, he's not... Um, you know, uh, this great actor, um, you know, Daniel Day-Lewis, but I said, you know, he does something very special. And the thing I said to them is I said, and I got to tell you, as a producer, you know, I'm going to make sure that we give him more to do because I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. Someday the show's going to go off the air. And because you have no imagination as a network, you're going to bring it back. You're going to do a team Night Rider, you do Night Rider 2028 or whatever. You're going to even at some point bring the show back as a show again, you know, as they've done with, with Magnum, they've done with all these shows. So they have Hawaii 5 They have no um, imagination and it covers their ass, you know, to do shows that are already done. And I said, I'll tell you what's going to happen. And I said, I wish I can keep in touch with you because I will bet you $10,000. I'll write out a check that every one of those shows are going to fail. They're not going to work. Why? Because David's not in them. And you can throw everything you want into it. And, and that, as you know, happened. And when people like yourselves talk about Knight Rider, they all talk about the original Knight Rider. No one cares about Team Knight Rider or Team whatever. In fact, the NBC brought me in too late when the last Knight Rider came on. Yeah. The wonderful executive producer. I think he did Vegas. And he also, I think, was the original of Fast and Furious. He's a terrific writer, producer. But it really wasn't his fault. But they... You know, and they threw, you know, one thing real quick on that, which is funny, you know, in Knight Rider, he would drive into a semi and that was where they had all of the gadgetry and April, you know, and all that was done right yeah. in this little set. In the new Knight Rider, they spent millions of dollars and they did this like James Bond massive room and they put, uh, you know, the, the 
car was on this strange the thing that moved all over the i think i counted something like 75 screens and all you know and they made it no one can no one wants that you know that's not what's supposed to be right. and the reason i mentioned that too as a producer is the other thing that a, a producer like we do is we first work with writers and we get to the stories now in those days you'd have to you would write up what we would call um like sometimes we call it a, a tv guide blurb it would just be you know a uh, an idea a paragraph this is what the story is it's like you see in the tv guide this is you know you know david must go meet an ex-girlfriend who is kidnapped because of all that yeah that's it yeah, yeah. okay that would be sort of and they go okay that's interesting the next thing you do is they would put out well, a step outline which is it's four x there's usually four scenes, five scenes. What just first act? David goes to blah, 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 and finds out. Blah, blah, blah. You do that. Then, and this is where the producer would work with them. Then, believe it or not, you'd, you would write a treatment, which was literally a short story. It would be up to 50 pages. It would be the story, but done as in, in um, prose. You would write a treatment. And you'd do several versions of that. And if that was approved... Then you'd go to your drafts, and the producer was there to work with you. And it would be first draft, second draft, third draft, and so forth. And the other thing that was very important, and it is today on the really good shows, the few really good shows that are there, when you have really good showrunners. And it's something that in the old days we used to call, Kojak wouldn't do that. Do you remember the Kojak, yeah, the yeah, series? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what that meant was, and then sometimes they would say Tom wouldn't do that, because it became sort of a magnum thing was that you had to be careful because if you did if you remember kojak that telly savalas uh, yeah. let's just say night let's just say night rider david david would never if you ever notice he would never get so angry at some guy that he would do like a martin scorsese in goodfellas with Roy leota he would not you know take you know be him to a pulp right or you know a joe pesky thing he would not oh, get oh, so only, only when his wife gets killed uh in season yes. four that, that that's the only uh, time but but you you're right on this yeah yeah, yeah. and i'm just going to bring that up because yeah. in the very few times you do something like that it is so strong yeah that it works and i was just going to bring that up um his real wife actually um by the way i, I you know everyone knows this but i just think it's one of this craziest coincidences I'm, i'd love to have told this to david back then to say yeah kathleen she, she's going to divorce you but she's going to marry someone named michael knight <laughs> yeah you know yeah, that you, is yeah. so funny yeah it is what a coincidence mind-boggling when i first heard <laughs> but the point of that is is that it's very important that the producer keeps the show on a rail that it does just what those characters would expect to do and yeah. well there was a thing you know you know you've ever heard the expression jump the shark yeah yeah uh, and you know where that comes from do you know where that expression comes from no 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 um there's a show called happy days and the Fonz, it, it was getting tired and that's what happens to shows that are on too long and they did a show which you know for ratings happy days in hawaii and in it, you have the Fonz, also, which would never happen, on skis. He's water skiing. And he um, he ends up, uh, there's, I guess it was time of Jaws, a shark crosses him. And he literally goes, ah! and he jump. you see him jump the shark. He goes over the shark he's doing, which is so unhappy day, so unfonz that you know it, it, everything crumbled after that it's exactly what happened and i remember saying you shouldn't do this on on um oh what is that called uh huh the one with bruce willis and sybil shepherd uh, moonlighting moonlighting yeah and uh, the great thing about it like these shows with the sexual tension and the, the thing you should thou shall not sleep with each other yeah because once they do the show is over and that's jumping the sh and they did and then the show when it went to the toilet the one that's used now is uh, crawling out of the refrigerator is the expression and that comes from crystal skull you know indiana jones where make another long story short uh but if you remember indiana jones is in this uh fake neighborhood that turns out to be a nuclear test and he crawls into a refrigerator and the bomb goes off and he flies in the air and it crashes way you know out miles away and he crawls out of the refrigerator which is great for the roadrunner cartoon yeah or something or that. buster keaton but not for that and that you know destroyed it so that's the other thing that the producer gets involved in but then he is involved uh with um 
the, you know, um, he goes on location scouts, which is, I have a story about that in here, which is where you're going to do the shows. You deal with the art director, designers, etc. So you, you know, what is the looks of everything that's going to go in there? Of course, casting becomes very important. Uh, you are at the dailies every day and I've had to do this. And sometimes when you're watching things and it's not being done right, you have to go back to the director. On rare occasions, you have to reshoot. Sometimes what you have to do is just say, no, we're not going to put that in. You work with the editors afterwards. You are then, as you know, when that then, if there's special effects or whatever, or miniatures or whatever, you're dealing with with those people. And you are the person on the top who who's one of, who makes the decisions, including, which is very funny in my Western, I wanted to do make it very Serge Leone, who was my hero and of many. And uh, so he has always lots of close-ups of guns of people. Think. So we had what was called the Wild Side Kamikaze Insert Crew. And so we had tons of little inserts and things. In fact, I directed a lot of those, but that was very important. So when you do these shows, and in these shows, like, for example, if you see Michael Knight, and they're saying, did you see this here? And then they cut to his finger and you do that. Yeah. Well, that's not on the stage with 112 people. You have an insert stage where you go back and you do that. And so he's involved in all of that. And in, and in, and in the, I, because I used to be a musician and a composer and so forth, I'm very involved in the music. Yeah. And one thing that... Uh, Actually, Robert um, Foster, executive producer for years of, of the show, wonderful guy, interesting character, but he was very involved in, in, I wanted them to do this, but he's the one who gets responsible for what called sound alikes, where you, we couldn't afford whatever, you know, um, uh, you know, um, some Hotel California. So you would have a group do a sound alike that sounds like Hotel California, but you'd have to put them in there. And the other thing, which I have a story about here, too, which I would get involved in, Universal had a, gave producers a big problem. They, two things. One, which I had the story with Gina Davis would talk about it. They were using old, antiquated um, 35 millimeter cameras, these big, huge cameras from the th 40s and the 50s with these giant blimps like you see in the movies. You know, you see those big yeah. old cameras. And at that time, the Panaflex and the Panavision was coming out, which was a much smaller camera. And uh, But Universal had 30, 40 of these, you know, since the beginning. And these things were ho workhorses. You know, you, they would work forever. And, you just, you know, they, and they had a whole, you know, um, cat factory in there that kept them going. We had to use those cameras. We couldn't use it. And the same is they um uh, they didn't want to they, they kept saying we have these this old style they're called nagros they're the um recorders for the sound and they had a certain way in which it was used with a with a crystal sink and all this other stuff and what would happen is night rider especially was very much an outdoor show yeah because you you know you didn't shoot you know kit in the sound stage very often and therefore, we're outside. Well, that wasn't true of a lot of shows, except Colombo had this problem, too. And anyway, so if you ever watch a Colombo episode, what would happen is they they wanted to do this because they knew that all of the sound done outside was going to be useless. And they'd have to go in what's called ADR. And the actors have to go in literally sometimes, it's, which means, you know, automatic dialogue replacement, would have to replace every bit of their dialogue that's outside. And one thing real quick, if any of you people ever watched an episode of Columbo, Peter Fox said, F you, I, you know, you got me out there. There's the equipment that can record it. He said, you know, and it was right. He said, you know, uh, Stanley Kubrick did Clockwork Orange, you know, and he had scenes underneath uh, the pass of a freeway and you can use it if you have the right equipment. And he says, I'm not going in for ADR. So if you watch a lot of the Columbo episodes inside, everything is great. But if you go outside, the other actors are going, you know, well, I don't know what you're talking about. And you go, <laughs> and then, well, I don't know that. <laughs> that question, because he wouldn't do EDR. And so anyway, we, um, we had those problems too, because we would have, and so I found very early on that uh, as a producer that, you know, I would go and was usually done at night to the ADR with the actors uh, because, you know, the performance is now the director wasn't there anymore. You, you're, uh, we had a Ber Bernadette or Bernie, I forget, Bernice, I think her name is a wonderful associate producer. And, uh, she was involved in that, but she wasn't a director then, you know, she just wanted to get the, the things out. So we got involved. And then I said, in the editing of it, 
uh, we, we get involved. And even to the point of, in those days, we sometimes had to rearrange things. The thing about um, the show, the, the, all these shows that I'm mentioning, these were called honeypot shows by the networks. And the reason they're honeypot shows is in those days, you maybe had remote, but you didn't have, you know, a lot of people were still clicking. And the idea is, is if you had a really hot show at 8 o'clock, like Magnum, like Knight Rider, like, you know, all these shows that I did, Six Million Dollar Man, um, Rockford Files, uh, people are so lazy. This is the absolute truth that they found that they would stay all the way through, you know, 11 o'clock and then to Johnny Carson or whatever the show, yeah. you know, to the news uh, on that station. So they would be there for your nine o'clock and your 10 o'clock show. So that'd be really important. So not only did you have to make that an exciting show that's going to get them right away, and sometimes you had to go back and really kind of beef it up a little bit. But as a producer, the other thing you would do, and you would do this in the writing of it, but in the middle of the show, halfway through it, you had what they called station identification. If you've ever heard that and here in America, I don't know if you have that here, they'll say, you know. And the, what it was is that they use an F, um, FAA, uh, an FCC, FCC um, law to get double commercials. Because the law was that in 30, every 30 minutes, you had to identify what your station was, for whatever reason. Say, so this is NBC, right? But what the networks realized, oh, I know what I'll do. We'll do a series of commercials, and then we'll say, this is NBC with the peacock, blah, blah, blah. And then there'll be another series of commercials. So they'll get double, and then they'll go back. Now, the problem with that, if you'll notice, is, is that the second act ending had to have something really... Oh my God! You know, clip to keep people to go through two sets of commercials, you know. And so these were, you know, uh, the kinds of things. And and seriously, those laid a lot was laid upon the producer to uh, make sure that you know you had these things. Yeah. And most important, and something that uh, you know you can say I go on forever about everything. And I have a couple of things about this which are very funny, but where the producer really. Uh, the what I was again the showrunner producer was really responsible for was it was sort of like in the war movies where you have the guys or in D-Day the guys who went out first you knew they were going to get shot you know they were the shield yeah yeah, yeah. And, you know they talk about human shields like they did in Iraq and so we were human shields the network you would have people uh, development people at the network that were assigned to certain shows. And they had to show, and their the network said, okay, they're going to make sure that this show, you know, is brilliant because of the genius of the network, right? Who have nothing whatsoever to do with any shows ever, and so, and you would usually get younger executives who were kind of coming up to, and they would say, okay, you're assigned to a night writer in this show and this show. Sometimes, if it's a big show, even one show. The problem is, I luckily, and I'm not going to take credit for this, but I was on really top-rated shows. Now, for the net, if the network executive is going to send shows top rated, he wants to make it look like he's responsible for that. Yeah. The first thing he will do yes, is he will call me with a problem. We got I I see a real problem here. I'm looking at the show and you know by the David shoes. Uh, you know he's wearing these little high these shoes. They're not high enough. You know, and it's really, people are really distracted. He says, and I have research. Our research department is totally. Uh, you're going to have. What are we going to do? Uh, here's my suggestion. Give him, don't get on their sneakers, because he looks weird in sneakers, you know, make sure he's always in boots. That was an actual note, by the way. Yeah. He must always be in boots, you know. So you so the, you have to deal with that kind of thing all the time. Yeah. One thing that uh, I'm, uh, 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 it's a lot, uh, uh, that um, I think I saw that someone else heard about this, because I think it's even an internet movie database, but I can tell you the story really quick. I kept getting, as the show got higher in the ratings, the more problems they would find yeah. that and it wasn't that they wanted you they wanted you to facilitate their solutions you see because then they would write their to their people and say yeah i found out that people didn't like david and sneakers i said get him in those boots and he's in those boots and you know people are, so you know that's what producer has and you have to become this unbelievably um you know, negotiator to understand you know, how to deal with these people. Now, a lot of producers like Belisario told him to go f themselves. You know, and uh, you know, and I respected him for that. And a lot of stuff that he did. As a matter of fact, and once I got into trouble, we did a real quick. We did a Thunder in Paradise, not Thunder in Paradise, another show. I did. 
<laughs> which is Tales of the Gold Monkey. And we had um, uh, Can Can Girls from Paris and basically whores that come into the town, you know, to sell themselves. And they're doing the Can Can, right? And this character named Lumiere, who is their pimp, their, their guy, is saying, you know, this girl is great. And so. Um, when there's and what it was was it was a it was an incredible show we had like 300 extras and what it was they thought they had found gold so there was a gold it was bust there was a bust so in other words there was hundreds of people from all over come to the island so they have all these people selling things and tools and you know shovels and whores and whatever so the executives came out because and then there's the huge fight we did where everything gets destroyed it's really wonderful scene but the executives love to come out for that stuff because also because of the way it's done, that's a day where even though it's on the lot, they they uh, they give you food, and so the executives come out and you know and the food is usually very good. But anyway, um, so these executives are walking by and I'm walking by and I go, oh, I said, and they said, oh, it's so good, it's so authentic, and we had this fabulous tutorist, I think, brilliant costumer, uh, and you know he everything was done to the period of the time. I said, yeah, I said, you know, those dresses, they're exactly like the Moulin Rouge. And if you notice, um, and I told, and I, unfortunately I, I told them this, um, after which I said, we, the scene, cause the girls were just walking around. I said, we shot the scene with these girls and you know, you know why the can can was so, you know, why they kicked their legs up. And this is actually true. We didn't wear underwear. So they're always exposing their vaginas. And so the people in the world, they went crazy. Oh my God. And the next day, because of my stupid mouth, I had to go to the studio and to a special room where they had a special projector. Because, you know, if you show one frame at a time, it'll burn. Yeah. But they had, a projector, they had a special filter on it that would keep the heat away. And for those sequences, we had to go through every frame. Now, remember, there's 24 frames a second. <laughs> Every frame <laughs> in the vagina. Uh, now, here's nice. a, and this, I know you guys will love the story. So the last part of the story, which is hysterical, is that the room only held about 25 people. There must have been 50 people in that room. Yeah. Why? Because they were hoping this vagina room. They wanted a glimpse. They wanted a glimpse, and they were so disappointed, you know, when they didn't get it. The thing I was going to say, which drove me crazy, was, which you may have heard, was... I remember I told you about how I was creating more of a relationship between David and Kit, you know, and the one thing when they hated, which I, we started was Kit, I need you, you know, which people love, you know, and they love the idea that Kit came to his rescue, you know, he was, but the network kept saying, you got to tone it down. You have created, there's obviously a gay relationship between Kit and the car and between David and the Kit. And they were dead serious. Now, First, there's a hundred things, but you also want to say it's a car, guys, you know, yeah. so, uh, but they were getting, and they were actually at some point, you know, in these shows, and they came to me and they said, listen, you know, we're going to take, we're going to, you know, uh, you know throw, not do that show if you show Kit, because in night in Nightmares, especially, if you remember, and some others, he says, you know, I really, he says, well, what, what was I like? You know, I really, he was this and he was, you know. Yeah. Yeah, but I really liked him. You know, remember that? He yeah, comes off as yeah, yeah. And he said, you know, we don't need to see a love affair between the two. I mean, next thing is they're going to be kissing. So uh, I don't know. I've never, I don't know if I've ever told this quick story, but for you guys, I will. I was so pissed that we used to send, if we were going to do reshoots or whatever, because they had always every script and every rewrite, and they had to read it. And it also went to their censorship people and their legal department and so forth. So um, I had written to them and said, listen, and we had uh, we had done um, it. I forget the episode. I think it was Night in Shining Armor. It wasn't Nightmares. And I said to the network, listen, we have to do a reshoot. And so I'm going to send you the pages. It's important we have this moment. And what it was is it's in the morning and they're in the um, uh, they're in the semi or kids in the semi. And the lights come on and Michael comes in and he looks like, you know, his hair is all messed and he's like this. And it's silent. And, and this is all in the description and it's silent. I actually have the script somewhere. I should read it out someday to you guys. I mean, the pages. And he comes out and then, Michael, aren't you going to say anything? He said, oh, kid, I'm really sorry. Well, you think you're sorry. You think how I feel. He says, I know. He says, you know, Michael. I was waiting for that night for a long time. And I thought, he goes, well, what do you mean? Well, 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 wait a minute. 
took you to a car wash, you went to a drive-in, I got you some new oil, and I said, yes, but what happened afterwards, Michael? I drank, okay, a little too much tequila, I understand. And then he's, he's searching for something, and then in the script it says, <laughs> he pulls out a, a, a toilet brush, he goes, look, just let me, and he like, let me get to your exhaust and let me just clean it out. <laughs> <laughs> and Kit says, Michael, hey, she's going to have to put in a whole new muffler. That's not going to do it. <laughs> and then he goes, oh, geez. Uh, uh, and this is in this thing I wrote, and he goes, oh, geez. Um, do you know where my belt is? He goes, yes, Michael. He says, you left it here with a lot of other things. He says, but I ran it over when I went there. He says, it's okay. I've already called the company, and they're going to make you a new one. And then he says, you know, that's a nice belt. He says, I know. I got that in the row. He goes back and forth. And then it ends where he goes to the front of the car, and he looks down at the uh, scanner, and he says, whoa, gosh, we're going to need some Windex. And <laughs> Kit says, Michael, we used up all the Windex last night, and frankly, it's going to need more than just Windex. And he says, look, I, I want you to know that I am so sorry, and I love you. And Kit says, well, a little late, but appreciated, and I love you too. And then it says Michael leans down and kisses the hood you know, of the car. And we, I said, we sent it. And it was done all the official, you know, universal thing in the right color and all that. And, uh, and this guy went, of course, absolutely. And I said, but here's the thing. Now, here's the other part of it. I showed it to, my, I showed it to David. And you know what his response was? Why did you send it? We should have shot it. Yeah. I yeah, we could have shot that scene, no problem. Everyone would come in, which would have been fabulous. But, you know, in that degree, that was his reaction. We should have shot that scene. I love it. And even Woody Daniel said, oh, yeah, I'm in. I'm in. But um, the good news about the network, I mean, the studio, was that I suddenly got calls, and I'm and I'm bracing, you know, but I don't care what's going to happen. Because we didn't do it, says the man. Oh, I must tell you, we told him we shot the scene. And it's already edited into, you know, the, the final, the final, uh, uh, I forgot what we call it, the final chain, which is, you can't change, it's going to actually, that's what's going to air. It was only a couple of nights later. And so, and I will say that the people from the network who uh, called, uh, I mean, I mean, from this tower, the universal people, when my you know, secretary said, yeah, I've got um, Dick Lindheim or, you know, whoever it was on, on the phone, you know, and I know. I picked up the phone, and as I'm picking it up, I'm hearing hysterical laughter. I can hear it already. They loved it. They absolutely – and they said, well, you know, you've got to send – he says, they, read, they, they didn't have it. The guy read it to them. He says, you've got to send copies. We're going to find – we've got to – and, like, they all loved it. But, of course, the people in the network got really all upset about the whole yeah. thing, and they had to explain to him. So, anyway, that's where the producer in, in so many ways – does I, I'll say one other thing in a timeline, which is crazy. If you're doing a show, you have one show that's already shot, so you're dealing with all the post production stuff that I explained. Yeah. You are working with writers now. We don't do it, they're all staffed now, but in those days you had freelance writers. You had we had you know we had three or four staff writers. We had Rob Gilmer, we had Janice Hindler, Janice yeah, Janice Hindler and myself, three terrific writers, and uh, and Robert Foster, who also wrote. Um, but we also brought in you had freelancers who would come in and pitch projects. So a lot of your time is to come, they'd come in and say, okay, here's an idea I have, you know, shit, blah, 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 you know. So you're dealing with that. You're dealing with post-production on a show. You have a show that's in production at the moment, and you have a show that's in pre-production. So you're also dealing, and that's all happening on the same day. Yeah. Yeah. You do that for 22 weeks. So that's, that's what you have to have. And luckily, um, you know, if you, um, uh, it, it, what happens, I will say on shows that I've done, once you're into the, the rhythm of the show, it literally is like they say, it, it's like every writer, writer's fantasy. It kind of writes itself because you know the characters so much. Remember the, like the Mary Tyler Moore show? You used to see that show. Remember that? Yeah. Let's say you did a show. I said, here's the idea to you. This is a show where Mary uh, is looking at videotapes or something and sees a tape of Ted Baxter naked with, some, with, with Betty White. 
okay, you know, the, the character. Anyone in America who watched that show could write that episode. You know how he, she's going to act, you know how Lou is going to act, you know how, you know, you, you could write that show, right? Yeah. That's how genius those shows are. And when you have a show that's really going, you get to the point where when I'm writing a show, and I got to a point where I was writing some of these shows, you know, in a day and a half or so the entire show, you're almost going, you're, you're like in a, you're like a, um, you know, in a, uh, in a trial. Going, sh- sh- can you be all slow? Because you're actually seeing them talk and so forth. So that works out really, really well. But, um, you know, that's, that's, that's when it becomes joyous, when everybody is, you know, on the same Yeah, realms. because it kind of uh, um, uh, seems as if you, you, you have to be up, 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 up here, you have to be uh, somewhat of an octopus um, uh, to be able to handle both, both, both pre-production and, and in-production and post-production. Yeah, and the thing is, is that, you know what, when, I, when you think back at it, Or even back then, when you think of it, when you think of what you did, you go, oh, my God. And, you know, in hiatus, I need when you're doing it, as you know, there's a great expression. If you want something done, give it to a busy person. Huh. And uh, there, you, you do it mostly because a little bit like, like I got, got the reputation as someone who can write very, very quickly. I did a, a thing, a two hour episode, which is not launch. I won't go into called the Bionic Boy, which is a spin off the Six Million Dollar Man why and how I won't go into it, but it was a two hour and all I had was the title and the fact that it had to be shot in Kanab, Utah, which is like Zion National Park, why and how I won't go into it. But um, uh, the, the head of NBC at the time, Brad Tartikoff said, you know, and I was a kid, I was like 19 at the time, and he said, um, okay, we want this, but uh, we need, all I know is to shot there, spin, you know, Bionic Boy, uh, two hour, and, um, Uh, and he call, he had talked to me on Thursday night, and he says we need it Monday morning. <laughs> yeah. So. And that would be a lot. Yeah. Now you know, I work. I did not sleep. I and I did get it done. And there's that's a you know that there's trillion stories on on that and what happened. But and you know they did it. It was a massive hit and all that. But my point is is that. What I kept trying to tell people, and I did this on this, I did this on other shows, I did a show called Thunder in Paradise, where I was doing two-hour shows in two days and things like that. And uh, what I tried to explain to them is, I'm like the grandmother who sees that her grandson is, un, you know, pinned under a car and is able at 80 years old to go there and lift the car and pull her out. That's because there's that one time. Grand- I said, you don't then go to that grandmother and say, you know what, we're going to put you in as a strong man in a circus and we're going to give you lifting cars every day. You know, and that's kind of what, what happened. But I will say that, you know, and I, today they're not as much, but the, the writers in that era, like they said, um, the, that I worked with so many. Another one is uh, um, Ruben Leader and, um, 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 oh, shoot. Uh, yeah, as I said, um, uh, well, anyway, a lot of the writers that I worked with at the time, um, Geiger was another one. They they um, they were so professional. Yeah. And Janice, Janice was terrifyingly fast, you know. But here's the difference: you can be fast, but they're also good. Yeah. And one other person that is, you know, has done a lot of stuff, but he, but he fought. I he, I ended up doing all the shows. He ended up doing the shows. I ended up. And then he ended up becoming an incredibly good feature writer, and that's Stephen D'Souza. Yeah. You probably know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was involved as well. Yeah. He, he created Car. The evil twin of Kit yeah. was Stephen Susan. Yeah. And the one thing that Stephen did, which I learned from the geniuses of Will Sa- Bill Sackheim and Joel Lansky and all that, which you don't see very much anymore. But Ibsen once said that if you see, if, if, a, if a play opens and the curtain opens up and you see um, uh, on the wall two pistols, you know they're going to be used by the third act. Yeah. And the idea is, is that he would do what I do. He'd love to set things up early on that don't seem significant, but you remember them, and then they're used. Yeah. Sometimes they're used to save, and sometimes they're used to solve a problem. And that's that kind of um, intermingling, that wonderful weaving, is is really the strength of so many shows at the time. And in his features, but Stephen was a master at that. Yeah. And it was funny, as a producer, what I was trying to do with so many of the shows was inter- interweave those. Today, I think we used to do something which now they call eggs. And uh, another, for another time, you know, Knight Rider is filled with eggs. Uh, we didn't call them eggs, though, yeah. at the time. Well, that's all for now, folks, uh, regarding Knight Rider, uh, the role of being a producer and writer on Knight Rider, uh, and eggs, of course. Um, 
I'll be back with part two of this interview where we'll dive deeper into uh, some of the characters in uh, Knight Rider and, and get mu much more uh, insight into the thoughts uh, surrounding the show. So, bye for now.